A hawk moth is one of the largest flying insects. Sometimes they're called hummingbird moths because they hover in front of a flower. I've always been interested in this field, in part because I think the way animals move is just fundamentally beautiful. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Hawk moths are a hovering specialist because of this flower feeding behavior. They're extending a proboscis as long as their body and trying to fit it into a specific part of a flower. It's like trying to drink from a soda can with a six foot long straw. They beat their wings uh, somewhere between 30 and 50 times a second, depending on the species. Hummingbirds are a little faster, 40 to 80 times a second. But hawk moths can do a lot of what a hummingbird can do. They can back up, they can fly sideways, they can go up and down. Hawk moths are able to produce lift on the upstroke and the downstroke. So when their wing is going forward, and that's a little bit more powerful, it probably produces about 60% of the lift the animal needs. But then they flip their wing around and bring it back and generate lift on the upstroke also. And that's about the remaining 40%. So that even distribution of lift makes them more efficient flyers compared to a regular bird that does almost all of its lift on the downstroke. We'd like to probe this general capability of the moth to maintain stability, recover from perturbations by destabilizing the hawk moth. See, tasty. A miss, but a reload. Our moth cannon uh, is actually a spring-loaded launcher, a custom design with some plastic toy parts and also a 3D printer. The cannonballs themselves are wrapped in modeling clay to make them a little bit stickier and easier to handle. We're often hitting them with a projectile that's anywhere from 10 to 20% of their body mass. It's sort of like me taking a big bag of flour and throwing it at you and asking you to catch it. Um, and it maintains stability, say, while you're dancing on ice or something like that. This sounds like an enormous perturbation. At the same time, it's also just a consequence of being very small. This is what happens in real life for insects all the time. They're encountering forces that are way out of scale for their own bodies and have to respond to it effectively and continue about their business. All right, and let's see what happened there. We can pitch them up by 90 degrees, and two or three wing beats later, they're hovering and looking for their food source again. And these are 20 fifths of a second. So in the blink of an eye, they can be recovered from a huge aerial stumble. And we really would just like to see how this is working. So we use high-speed video at 1,000 frames a second to give us about 40 frames for every hawk moth flap so we can see in detail what's going on. And we use three cameras because we want to be able to reproduce the motion in three dimensions. We stitch them all together as a calibrated network. Unfortunately, these are hawk moths. That means they like to fly mostly at night. So we have infrared lighting that is just below the threshold where the moth can see it. So it's totally invisible to the moth, but highly visible to the high-speed camera sensors. So after we've done the experiments, the next step is getting the actual measurement out of that. So we have a bunch of custom software that we developed over the years for that. The flight of the hawk moths is much more stable than the early models predicted. Before its nervous system has even had time to react, the inertial effects of the moving body rotate the wings almost into the right position to help with the recovery. It's essentially already recovering in the next 25th of a second, almost an automatic recovery that wasn't part of the initial theoretical models. The hawk moths are teaching us some of the underlying principles for how flight stability works for insects. 
if you wanted to build a small flapping wing vehicle, what are the requirements to not just power it, but to make it stable in an environment that is not very friendly to small flying things? They're teaching us general lessons of how this stability problem has been solved by evolution. In the next decade, I expect to be able to put a tiny microchip on the back of the animal with some wires leading into its muscles that's going to report when are those muscles actually active. The emerging capabilities for understanding all these different aspects of flight are just enormous.